Alderman Vollmer. Present. Alderman Davis. Alderman Arnowitz. Present. Alderman Hubbard. Alderman, Alderman Carter. Chairman Schmidt. Here. Four present. You have a quorum. Thank you. All right, on Board Bill 37, we have somebody from our health our human services department here to explain that. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Valerie Russell with the City of St. Louis Department of Human Services here to talk about the St. Louis reentry. You might want funding. to get it closer to you. We can't hear you. Thank Sorry? You. Is that better? That's great. Um, Valerie with the Department of Human Services, and I'm here to talk about the reentry funding that the state of Missouri is uh, willing to award to the Department of Human Services to provide reentry services for former offenders. These are individuals who have timed out of the Department of Correctional System, meaning they've served their maximum sentence. They are not at that point put under probation or parole, they are released. So the funds are to provide those individuals with assistance and only those individuals who would be returning to the city of St. Louis. The assistance that the funds are to provide relate to housing, social services, mental health services, physical health services, and employment. The state is uh, awarding, if accepted, $750,000 and can be used over a 24 month period it's the contention of our department that we would subcontract those services out completely, but only with entities who have provided this same service for these same individuals um, because they have an experience with these former offenders. Uh, we've put an RFP together and have secured bids. We've not awarded a contract or reviewed those at this point in time. Uh, the services, as I indicated, would be for housing, physical health, mental health, and employment. We would be administering the funds. And you indicated what the period of time would be for, for doing this? It would be an 18-month contract that we would award. Um, the funds would not be available to us after June 30th if we do not accept them, and that would be June 30th of 2014. So we have to let the state know that we will accept the funds and then we have 24 months in which to implement those services. Are there questions from the committee? Alderwoman Flowers. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, now the, you're, you're talking uh, people released from the Justice Center and MSI? No, no. these are from state okay. correctional okay. facilities. All right. And I believe there's about nine of them. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Alderman Valmer. Alderwoman Davis, Alderman Arnowitz. Um, and I don't have any questions. Um, I think you answered them all that these are individuals who fully serve their sentences. They're coming back into our community. These are services that have historically already been provided to the same individuals. However, these monies will allow for us to send out for bids on these same services and that we have to accept these funds by June 30th or they disappear and we have a 24 month uh, period of time in which to implement this, but we're choosing to do it within 18 months. That's okay. correct. Is there a motion to send Board Bill 37 out of committee with a due pass recommendation? A motion. So second. There's been a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Alderman Flowers. Aye. Alderman Vollmer. Aye. Alderman Davis. Alderman Arnowitz. Aye. Alderman Hubbard. Alderman Carter. Chairman Schmidt. Aye. Four I votes to pass. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, so today, and I was uh, hoping that we would have um, more aldermen here. Hopefully, they'll get to see this on the YouTube because STL TV is here today. There's been a study that's been ongoing with regard to the disparities in health care, not only in the city of St. Louis, but this particular study is with regard to the region, in fact, of, of St. Louis. Uh, but throughout this country with regard to African-American health care. Um, and so I would ask uh, Dr. Jason Purnell to come forward and tell us some of the um, stark facts.
Thank you, Alderman Schmidt. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here this morning. My name is Jason Purnell. I'm an assistant professor in the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis and also the lead investigator on uh, for the sake of all, which is a report on the health and well-being of African Americans in St. Louis. And as Alderman Schmidt alluded to, uh, the study geography is actually St. Louis County and the city of St. Louis. Um, just wanted to give you a brief overview of the presentation for this morning, uh, why we're considering not just health and health care, but also education and economic status in this report. Uh, what our project goals are, what our process, and who our partners have been. A uh, summary of the five briefs that we've released between August and December of last year. Uh, the next steps that we're seeing, and any questions that you might have. So I'll be following along with you in this packet of slides that I've uh, handed out for you. Essentially, a reason why we're considering health education and economics all together is that we see persistent disparities uh, by race and ethnicity. On the left you see for the city, of, uh, city and county of St. Louis, that orange line up top is the mortality rate for African Americans, the gray line is the mortality rate for whites. We want those lines to go down and to the right, that means that mortality rates are dropping overall but we see this persistent gap between mortality rates for African Americans and whites here in the St. Louis region. Uh, the graph to the right simply shows this at the national level, uh, broken out by both race and gender. These are life expectancies, so this is the opposite. Uh, but essentially, we want those lines to go up and to the right, and they are nationally. However, we see persistent gaps between white females and black females, white males and black males. Part of the reason that we uh, see these disparities is something we call the socioeconomic gradient in health. We might expect that the relatively affluent have better health than the poor, but what the gradient shows us is that at every step up the income ladder, your health improves. So the graph to the right is showing you that as income, household income goes up, your risk of premature death goes down at every step that income goes up. You can graph the same thing for another indicator of socioeconomic status, which is uh, education. That's what you're seeing on the left. That's part of our explanation. Going to the next slide, something that's particularly troubling is we're seeing that the gap in terms of education and life expectancy is actually widening. So people with high school or less education are gaining six months to no months of life expectancy, depending on how you look at the data, versus people with some college or more who are gaining a year and a half or more of life expectancy. And what you see on the next graph is really the take home message, which is that we spend about one in six dollars of GDP at the top of that pyramid on clinical interventions and individual focused intervention, but we're going to actually have the most impact on health and health outcomes at the bottom of that pyramid, where we're talking about socioeconomic factors like poverty, education, housing, and inequality. So that's some of the context for the project that we've been engaged in. Our goals for this project have been to attempt to influence the policy agenda on health disparities by widening our conversation around health beyond just personal responsibility and the delivery of medical care. Medical care and access to medical care is necessary, but not sufficient to deal with some of the disparities I've just described. Another goal is to inform the public about what we call the social determinants of health, particularly as they impact African Americans, one of the most vulnerable populations in the St. Louis region. To present the regional economic and health consequences of intervening or failing to intervene on social determinants of health and to provide evidence of the impact of persistent disparities on everyone in the region, regardless of their race or socioeconomic status. So our process over the past 14 months uh, has been, is outlined in the next slide. Uh, we received the funding from the Missouri Foundation for Health roughly in March of last year. Uh, spent that the first few months just establishing the staffing and a community partner group that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second. We released the five briefs that you see listed uh, between August and December of 2013. 
we were actually able to release our first brief on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington on August 28th of last year. I'll be talking about each of those briefs in turn. And all of these briefs and more information about the project is available at forthesakeofall.org. We also hosted a community feedback forum uh, and have briefed key leaders such as yourself uh, since March of this year. And we will be releasing a final report and hosting a conference on May 30th at the end of this month. The next slide shows you that we were very conscious about our community partner group, including people beyond just the usual suspects who's, who talk about and know about health and health disparities. We tried to include uh, leaders in education, in economic and community development, in business, uh, and in media. So you'll see our, we have a very diverse set of uh, partners, also a, a set of institutional partners in uh, the Institute for Public Health at Washington University, the Policy Forum at the Brown School, and our media partners, the St. Louis American, uh, and what was formerly the St. Louis Beacon is now part of St. Louis Public Radio. The first brief, I should also mention that this project is a partnership between Washington University and St. Louis University. Uh, so there are, there are uh, researchers from both institutions represented. The first brief was the brief that I offered, authored, uh, How Can We Save Lives and Save Money in St. Louis, Invest in Economic and Educational Opportunity. And we point out that not only are there health disparities, but we see disparities in education and poverty as well. So on the left, what you see is that African Americans in St. Louis City and St. Louis County are more likely to have uh, high school or less education, less likely to have some college or more. That's relevant given what I said in terms of the increasing gaps that we see uh, in terms of life expectancy and education. The poverty rate for African Americans in St. Louis City, St. Louis County is more than three times the rate uh, for African Americans as for whites. We were able to actually estimate the number of deaths in 2011 among African Americans 25 years and older that were attributable to either uh, poverty or low levels of education. It came out to 517 deaths, or roughly one in six deaths. And to put that into context, uh, that's enough lives to fill seven Metrolink cars at an economic cost of $3.3 billion in a single year. Throughout these briefs, we've also highlighted a set of recommendations for dealing with disparities, as well as efforts that are currently ongoing in the St. Louis region that we believe should be highlighted as potentially promising and scalable. Our two recommendations around the first brief are investing in quality early childhood development for all children and helping low to moderate income families create economic opportunities. And you can see some of the organizations and programs that we've listed. Our second brief was on how health influences education. So this is the relationship in the opposite direction. Uh, particularly how health impacts high school dropout. We noted that in 2012, one in every 10 African American 9th through 12th graders dropped out of school. That had an economic impact of just 1,000 new graduates. If 1,000 of those dropouts had stayed in school, that would translate into $11 million more in income every year uh, spending $21 million more on homes, increasing the gross regional product by $15 million, and adding $1.1 million to state and local tax revenues. So a substantial hit that we take and a substantial amount of money we leave on the table when students drop out of high school. We noted three pathways that help to uh, explain how health impacts dropout. The first pathway is when childhood, chronic childhood illnesses get in the way of students' attendance and their performance in school and can lead to school dropout. The second pathway is mental and behavioral health and the ways that that interferes with education and can, can lead to school dropout. And the third path is when students are performing poorly in school and then pick up risky health behaviors like drug uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, unprotected sex, which can also lead to problems that lead to school dropout. 
Our recommendations on the second brief had to do with investing in coordinated school health programs for all students and investing in counseling and psychological services for young people within schools, within schools and within the community. We highlighted uh, as an exemplary promising program the clinic that's being uh, run by Mercy Healthcare at Roosevelt High School uh, and being funded by the Boeing Corporation. Uh, and we're interested in doing some more extensive uh, evaluation of that project to see what kinds of health and educational impacts that is happening. But what you see in the graphic is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's framework for what coordinated school health looks like. It's not simply having the components of school health available, and not all schools have even all of those components, but actually integrating all of those components so that they talk to one another. That's what the CDC and, and what we mean by coordinated school health. The third brief is on mental health. We note that here in the city of St. Louis, adults spend about four and a half days a month in poor mental health, and in the county that figure is about three days a month, which is nearly half a week every month. Uh, feeling hopeless, anxious, or overwhelmed. In terms of disparities that we note, African Americans are using the emergency room for mental health conditions at 121% higher rate than whites in St. Louis City and St. Louis County, and are using, uh, are being hospitalized for mental health conditions at a rate that's 64% higher. Translating that into dollars and cents, we spend about $230 million on all St. Louis residents annually for mental health conditions, hospital charges associated with them. $96 million of that is spent uh, for African American care. That's roughly 30% of the population accounting for 42% of hospital charges, which suggests to us that outpatient community-based mental health care uh, access is lacking. Um, our recommendations around brief three were to improve screening and awareness, including addressing the stigma in mental health treatment, investing in community mental health centers, and improving the quality and availability of mental health data. I will note that those hospital data that we have uh, underestimate the prevalence of mental health, because that's just people who've made it to an ER or a hospital. Our fourth brief was on residential segregation, uh, entitled Segregation Divided Cities Lead to Differences in Health. We updated some of the data. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the BBC's report on the Del Mar Divide. Just updated some of that, showing uh, differences in income and education percent African American, both north and south of Del Mar. We also noted that policies, uh, some of the history of the policies that have led to segregation uh, that discriminated against African American uh, homeowners in St. Louis, but also led to and facilitated white flight from the center city, uh, leading to segregation, and then some of the disinvestment in areas that have become high levels of uh, population of African Americans, which leads to these pockets of concentrated poverty, uh, which is the, the key pathway that leads to many of the health outcomes that we see. Usually when I give this presentation by PowerPoint, I put these maps up one at a time, but you have them all uh, arrayed for you. The far left is the percent African American, which shows you uh, pretty starkly the level of segregation in, in the St. Louis region, St. Louis City and St. Louis County. The second graph is poverty. So in each of these cases, orange is gonna be the highest, the light blue is gonna be mid-level, and the dark blue is the lowest. So orange is the highest level of poverty. The, sec or the uh, third map is heart disease mortality. The colors mean the same thing. High levels, mid-levels, and low levels. And the final map is cancer mortality. So you can see that while there isn't absolute overlap, 
the orange tends to stay orange, the light blue tends to stay light blue, and the dark blue tends to stay dark blue. Our recommendations in this area were investing in quality neighborhoods for everyone in St. Louis, no matter where you live. Promoting development and housing choice without displacement of residents who are currently living in those areas, and promoting the benefits of diverse neighborhoods while safeguarding the fair housing laws that are currently on the books. Our fifth and final brief was on chronic disease in St. Louis, where we note a mixed picture, really. Um, the benchmarks that we're using are based on the Healthy People 2010 goals, which are set at the federal level. These are our goals for the nation in terms of uh, progress towards better community health. What you see for the first graph is that in terms of diabetes mortality, we've actually gone in the wrong direction for African Americans in the city of St. Louis. Uh, a 10% increase in deaths attributable to diabetes. Also a fairly large disparity in St. Louis County between whites and African Americans. And for the state overall, nowhere near the 43% reduction in diabetes mortality. Heart disease is a better story. We met and exceeded our heart disease mortality goals for Healthy People 2010 at every level, uh, the city, the county, and the state. And cancer is mixed. We're making progress towards the goal of a 21% reduction in cancer mortality. However, we have not reached that goal. In terms of the economic cost, we spend about $1.1 billion in hospital charges for just those three chronic conditions, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes in St. Louis, which is the equivalent of buying three Edward Jones domes every year. But we know in public health that lifestyle factors play a large role in helping to prevent chronic disease. And just those four factors you see right there, losing weight, healthy eating, physical activity, and no smoking, account for a large proportion of chronic disease. However, behavior happens in context. And not everyone perceives their context to be conducive to these behaviors. In St. Louis City, only 39% of African Americans consider their neighborhood to be safe. That has implications for if you let your children go out to play or if you go for a walk after dinner and engage in leisure time physical activity compared to 65% of whites in St. Louis City. Only 66% of African Americans find it easy to buy healthy food in the city of St. Louis. Higher numbers are seen in St. Louis County, but there's still a disparity in terms of the perception. Only 62% of African Americans in St. Louis County perceive their neighborhood to be safe compared to 87% of whites and 73% of African Americans find it easy to buy healthy food compared to 91% of whites. Our recommendations for the fifth brief include expanding partnerships and embedding health in all policies, which means no matter what the policy is, a zoning policy, economic development policy, we should be considering the health implications of it and investing in chronic disease prevention and management. On the next slide, we just wanted to give a sense of how these recommendations line up with the city of St. Louis's own sustainability plan. And this is just a sampling of the areas of uh, synergy and overlap. Uh, and I won't go through each of them, but you can see there, that there's a, a fair amount of overlap in terms of what the city has said its stated goals are in terms of sustainability and what we are recommending in terms of uh, addressing community health. And I will say that even though this is a report on African American health and well-being, all of our policy recommendations have implications for everyone in the region. Um, there isn't a carve out or set aside uh, kind of recommendation that we're, we are uh, proposing in this project. Uh, if we do these things, we believe that that has implications for the health and well-being of everyone in the region. In terms of our next steps, as I mentioned, we are releasing a final report which includes this information and more on May 30th at the Missouri History Museum from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. 
I'm very disappointed to learn that that uh, conflicts with the Board of Aldermen meeting that morning. Uh, but we will have the report uh, available online and we'd be happy to come back and talk to you again about uh, the additional information that we have in the report. Um, we're also looking at an additional round of funding from the Missouri Foundation for Health uh, to deepen and broaden engagement around our findings, both for youth, uh, young adults, and adults in the St. Louis region, continuing the kind of uh, engagement with policymakers uh, represented this morning and at, at the local and state levels, uh, engagement of business leaders in the region, implementation of an initial set of our recommendations, and uh, potential replication of this model in other parts of the state. And as I said before, uh, we're interested in doing a formal evaluation of the Mercy Clinic that's being operated at uh, Roosevelt High School. So I know I went through that quickly uh, in the interest of time, but I'm happy to take any questions that the committee might have. The list, Alderwoman Flowers. Thank you very much. Um, some of the things you touched on in the report I'm familiar with because the African American Caucus here at the Board of Aldermen did a disparity study some years ago, particularly on the mental health. You know, when we asked our residents, where do you go for mental health, most of them said they go to, people go to jail yes. because it's just not enough services out there and they end up doing something that gets them arrested. Yes. Um, so we have looked into that as far as, um, I'm happy to hear about the funding grant right before this presentation to help offenders because we noticed that there wasn't a lot of tracking after people were released as far as getting some help and assistance. Um, do you have this in a PDF file? Because I would love to share this with my community. My neighborhood, my ward was very high in heart disease at one time and I did everything I could to put in a walking trail and try to educate my people but my seniors aren't going to be able to read this if I print this out. So if you had a PDF that you can send us after, if it's appropriate after the 30th, if we can get you can You can get all of the information that's on these all slides on uh, okay. for the sake of all .org. Okay, it, so this is on now because before what was on were the five... Um, this is all drawn from the five briefs. Right, but... The, the graphics themselves are all drawn from the five briefs. I understand, but in this format, this is really a nice kind of format. Oh, no, the, I can get you, I can definitely get you a copy of the slides as well. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, I would recommend that you make sure all the aldermen get a copy of this. Well, as you know, I sent out what I had, um, what I had received at prior presentations and then also from for the sake of all but this is a new one for me so I would absolutely want to make sure everybody has it the one thing we didn't have broke down is the <coughs> economic impact the dollars and it's very interesting just to um, see how a child dropping out of school and the impact it has um, on our communities and our, our city and our state that's the one thing we really didn't get into so that, that was very interesting the uh, slide, speaking of the divide and the um, development and lack thereof and white flight and so forth, um, is really sad that under these new HUD regulations and this whole new um, way that money is divvied out through the city as far as development and so forth, and you may not be aware of that, but um, my community in particular is not really going to benefit at all from any round of funding coming out this year as far as development and we need it so bad in North St. Louis. I'm on the very edge of this map. I'm the orange. And I'm orange in almost everything except for the health, uh, the, the heart disease. Um, but, you know, it, it definitely is, I think, has a great impact when you don't have somewhere to go get something healthy to eat. I mean, honestly, Subway is the most healthiest thing in my ward unless you go to the Chinese place and get steamed rice. Um, it's very hard to find green leafy vegetables, um, fruits, and you know we get these pop-up corner stores, these convenience stores, and I understand convenience but fried chicken wings and french fries and um, pool boy sandwiches just not, is not doing it and it's just not teaching our children or giving our children uh, 
other healthier choices. So definitely the development is something that, you know, it hits me hard having the largest ward in the city, but the most underdeveloped business district close to my residence, which I've tried to emphasize with SLDC needs development. So um, I appreciate the report and the update. Um, I definitely want to try to do some more things to educate my residents on how to change their routine, particularly exercise and picking up things that are more healthier for you than not. So thank you for your presentation. Absolutely. And, and we, want to, uh, we want to support community members. Uh, what we're envisioning doing in this next round in terms of community engagement is actually translating some of this into discussion guides that the lay public can pick up and also some action toolkits giving people recommendations for how they might uh, implement and enact some of the recommendations and we'd be happy to to work with your your ward on that yeah because getting people particularly my residents which are, are seniors a lot of them don't like to drive at night and so forth and some will go to the, the events you're having but a lot of times they'll go to things that are right in their community and if there's sure. any way that we can present this to them it, just the way you did so that they can hear it sure because I got so many singers that are taking care of grandchildren and and mothers and uh, that that just it's hard to cook in the evening I'm, I'm a new mother per se and um, you know trying to find something healthy for a little two-year-old to eat you know you need some education so I know the health department came before us uh, Melba had got a grant to try to help daycares teach young mothers how to cook more healthier for their children. And this is something I'm very interested in and in trying to get people to eat and choose differently because that's really what's causing it. The diabetes, the heart disease, the high blood pressure, it's what you put in your body and that you have to keep your body active as well. Yes. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, I know that you mentioned the Healthy Corner Store, which is a great partnership. Um, but what I have seen is, is sort of what you mentioned, I don't know if you realized um, totally how big you mentioned this, and that is it's not only the store being there, but um, a lot of these stores are making a ton of money off of tobacco and lottery tickets and snacks and all the other stuff um, that you can put in your body, uh, but they're not getting people running in there saying, I really will buy this and then going in there and actually buying the things and knowing how to prepare it. So it's a chicken and egg thing and, and somehow we've lost that um, capacity to do some of that. Alderman Valmer. Um, Alderman Arnowitz. Well, let me talk about or ask about some of these if I can. Um, and, and race plays a huge component of this, but other components that you talked about, which cut across all aspects of um, the city and the region, which I think, um, you know, you, at one point you mentioned, Doctor, um, um, the uh, importance of this for the whole region, and I think that's an important takeaway because sometimes people think, you know, if they're not of the particular um, grouping, you know, German or Croatian or African American or whatever it is, they so, sort of tune out and this looks like it's directed to all, it's for the sake of all. Yes. Um, so, you know, some of this is on the education piece, some of this is on the jobs piece, which are interconnected. Um, so some of these are applicable to, to everyone and I noticed that you said in the education piece, that there were one out of 10 dropouts in high school, which in my, it's a tragedy, but in my mind, what I recollect is it was much worse than that only a few years ago. So do you have any sense, did you guys get any sense of what we've done successfully to keep more children in school? We didn't look at that specifically. I know that overall high school graduation in the nation has increased, but we didn't look at, at that in, in particular, no. 
Okay. And, and the reason I, I ask that, and I, and I suspect, and you've linked some of these in terms of, you know, health care. Obviously, if, I, if I'm a mom and I have four kids and they're going to three different schools and I have two jobs and I've got health issues, and then add on that I have mental health issues or I might have some sort of um, uh, drug addiction that's connected to that with self-medication and all those tend to be interconnected. But if somehow we're breaking that cycle and we're seeing that in terms of greater graduation rates, not only would it be helpful to know what we're doing wrong, it would also be helpful to know what it is that we're doing right so we could do more of that. I think that's part of why we've highlighted the school-based clinic that's at Roosevelt High School as an example of what we think is potentially something that's being done right, uh, which is increasing access to health care where students spend the majority of their day. Uh, we think that has potentially uh, been beneficial effects, and it's actually been tried in other communities uh, to great effect. Um, we've been uh, less likely to take it up here in the state of Missouri, and, and we think that's potentially a model that can be replicated. Well, and, and I appreciate that example, um, and, and I, I agree with you. Uh, that model did start out, and they had to kind of ramp it up. It started where it was just giving the um, uh, physical exams for the sports people there at the school. Now it's covering most of the students in the school as I understand it. And the next step is to try to deal with the parents and relatives of those who are students there and then hopefully the community surrounding it. Um, and so I give kudos to Mercy as well as to Boeing. I guess I wonder, you know, I've seen a lot of these over the years like um, uh, Caring Community, some other kinds of um, programs that existed that seemed to, to fail over time because there's a lack of individuals who see the benefit somehow to them or to their companies and so it's not funded. Um, so I'm, I, I, when you say it can be replicated, um, I'm hopeful that that's true and I'm wondering how you would see that happening. I think the evaluation is a key part of that. So uh, part of what we would propose doing in any evaluation is looking first at what health benefits are uh, accruing to the students as a result of the clinic being there, but also what are the educational benefits uh, in terms of attendance, in terms of academic performance, um, and then a, a real cost-benefit analysis. Um, how many trips to the ER are you preventing as a result of a kid being able to go downstairs to the clinic? Um, what are you doing in terms of uh, Medicaid reimbursement for that more costly hospital-based care versus care right there in the, the school clinic? Um, I think if we can put those kinds of numbers in front of both philanthropies and policymakers, you can make a more compelling case. Uh, in addition to bringing some of this national data to bear. Uh, there was an entire special section of the American Journal of Public Health, for instance, that looked at school-based health care as a model and showed a number of benefits, uh, particularly National for Journal of Public Health? the American Journal of Public Health, uh, particularly for students uh, with uh, higher rates of poverty, less access to health care, uh, less health insurance. So if I'm, if I'm the president of Boeing, though, what convinces me, or Wells Fargo, or uh, Bank of America, uh, what, what convinces me, I would argue what's going to convince me, other than philanthropic reasons, might be that I get a more educated workforce that, uh, that comes. So I don't know whether these are going to show that or not. Hopefully, over time, they will. Not just a more educated workforce, but a healthier workforce, because right. the two work in Connected. tandem. Right. And a healthier workforce means less health insurance costs and uh, costs of employing people. Yeah. We'll do that. I would also note uh, in that second brief, we also uh, talked about the investments uh, in St. Louis County in particular with the Children's Service Fund and mental health within schools as a, a promising practice. So not just attending to 
children's physical health, but their mental health as well. So, um, obviously, other members on the committee want to know how to get in touch with you. It's all listed here, is it not? Oh, no, there's not an email address for you. I brought some cards with me. I can give those to you. Um, on page three, this went pretty quickly. So, I think what you said is, what I caught is you said one in six dollars spent go on that highest portion of the pyramid? Yes. But you're suggesting that more dollars need to go in the, in the bottom base of that pyramid? Yes. Can you explain that a little more? So we spend roughly about 16, 17% of GDP on healthcare, um, which is that top quadrant of the pyramid that you see there. All of those things I want to emphasize are absolutely necessary medical intervention, clinical intervention, some of the interventions uh, in terms of healthy eating and diet and exercise, all of that is necessary. It's simply not sufficient to close some of these gaps and disparities. We're gonna have the largest impact at a population level on health by addressing some of these social and economic factors like education, like poverty. Um, they are driving a lot of what we see in terms of premature mortality. Well, I noticed you uh, referenced, which was good, the sustainability plan for the city of St. Louis. I'm assuming that you've seen the community health improvement plan as well that was a very uh, yes. uh, neighborhood-based uh, effort. And one of the things on that was um, the whole issue of poverty. And some of us sort of begin to throw up our hands because it's such a huge uh, issue in terms of dealing with that. And one of the things that we looked at in terms of mortality was not only diabetes and heart disease and l lung diseases and so forth, was, was um, mortality from um, murder, as a matter of fact, that we listed. Yes. So that's being accepted by the CDC now as a measure of mortality as well? Absolutely. It's a, uh, violence is a public health issue. and. Uh, there are some promising ways of uh, approaching violence as a public health problem. Uh, we talk about this a little bit in our final report, uh, what used to be called ceasefire in mm -hmm. Chicago is now called cure violence. It's taking this public health approach to uh, essentially arresting the transmission of violence uh, by interrupting that transmission. Well, so what, what I see, at least in your brief five, as you talked about uh, expanding partnership and embedding health in all policies, and um, I know that a lot of people are struggling and trying to do some of that, but I also see a lot of things that are sort of there as the building blocks, and I, I guess I'm curious about with, with, without additional resources and funding, how we're gonna be able to do that. Um, I mean, we have a violence prevention study that was done, and there were a lot, a lot of efforts with regard to that, particularly um, juvenile. Um, then we have the community health improvement plan. We have the sustainability plan. We have um, these studies. Um, we've tried to do some things in terms of um, even reviewing these convenience stores that come out rather than just saying that they have an automatic right to be there within a zoning district. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about how we would uh, expand those partnerships and embed health in our policies? I think the, the uh, methodology that's been suggested in public health is what's called a health impact assessment, um, which isn't necessarily a huge outlay of additional resources so much as it is an analysis for any major policy about what the health impact of that policy is going to be. That's the thought behind health in all policies. Um, and part of what we're trying to do with this project is alert people to the fact that when you're talking about education, you're talking about health. Right. When you're talking about community and economic development, you're talking about health. So that, uh, I like to say that, that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can have these conversations across silos, across sectors, and note that what you do in this space 
in education is going to have an impact on health, including any cuts that you make to education, uh, human services, is going to have an implication for health, which is one of our largest expenditures uh, at every level of government in this country. So by having a more, uh, by having a broader conceptual framework for how we think about policy, uh, we help to move the conversation forward in terms of health uh, beyond just medical care. Right, okay. Are there other questions? I know Alder Woman that you're here. Do you have some questions for Dr. Pernell? Uh, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to uh, clarify just so you know that I'm actually here kind of dual because I serve on the Regional Early Childhood Council. I'm on the Missouri Children's Leadership Council. So the agency nonprofit I work for does early childhood development and after school youth programs. And so when I'm going through this, a couple things that come up because it's always about funding. And that's the critical, crucial point that always comes up because we, in the studies, we'll find what's needed. But when it comes to getting the money to fulfill the needs, it's not there. Right. And just to give you an idea, the Medicaid expansion, <laughs> if we don't get that, that's, that's going to hurt everything here. The tax cuts that are coming in 2017, that's going to hurt everything in here in order to achieve what you're wanting to do. So um, I serve on public policy for the regional, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And so that has to be something that has to be looked at. And then the next thing that comes within that is the fact that we have so many nonprofits that are doing great, wonderful things, but um, the communication, the collaboration, especially when it comes to city county, and I noticed that this actual report was for both city and county, correct? Yes. Are you familiar with the fact that we're getting ready to launch Ready by 21? Yes. Okay, so this Ready by 21 would be perfect <clears throat> in collaboration with all these, these items. So yes. that's exciting that that's there. And the fact that the businesses are now putting early childhood at the forefront. But um, like I said, my biggest concern is those understanding that have the power and the ability to give out the funding of the best ways to get the funding to the areas that need it. And just to give you an idea, and this happened a couple years ago, is that um, there was just swipe cards given out for kids to have food in the summertime, but they didn't realize they had no way to get to fresh, healthy food. Right. So that has kind of come a little forward, but it hasn't quite gotten there. We, have a new, we do the federal nutrition program, so we go into the homes of the women or men who are watching children to not only teach them how to make food, healthy food, but they also get reimbursed by the federal government, and most are on WIC programs. So most of the zip codes we serve are in, in low to mod income in the underserved populations. Mm -hmm. So this is of, of great interest to me, but um, once again, my concern always comes down to the fact that we know what we need to do, but the collaboration and the funding is always where we stumble. And so I'm excited about the Ready by 21. Um, I'm excited um, that, I don't know if you'll be part of that, will Washington University be part of that, do you know? I've, I've been involved in that. I'm on the data team for Ready by 21 that's ramping up and have been monitoring it very closely and, and cheerleading from the sidelines, hoping that that gets done. Excellent. Well, cheerleading from inside as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. I am. I'm very glad to hear that because it is, once again, it is a proven program that we do need in our, in our area because it will bridge that gap between city, county, and crossing the bridge to St. Charles. And, and to your point about funding, I mean, that's why we're here this morning, uh, to be a resource for policymakers uh, to the extent that this information isn't known about some of these links between uh, education economic factors and putting the dollar signs on some of the impacts of this we hope has the impact of saying we need to invest further in this area but we we need your uh, we need the feedback of policymakers as well in terms of how how to make these recommendations real my biggest recommendation, and I've done it myself, is that when I talk to an elected official, I make sure that that talk includes exactly what in their area that they represent and how it's impacted. Because most people just assume it's only 
in certain areas, and that's not the case at all. We could probably take this information and drop it into the boot hill, and it'd be the Absolutely. exact same thing. Absolutely. But that's the point that has to be driven home, um, yes. is that we need to make sure they understand it does impact their area. So whenever I can do that, I do do that, because it does make a difference. Yes, and, and we want to tell the moral story in addition to the dollar sign story. Yes. Uh, so not just that this is impacting uh, the people that you serve from a moral standpoint, but here's the dollar signs next to that. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. And there's some people out in the audience there. Carl, were you planning on saying anything or anything from the mayor's office? Okay. Anything from the president's office? We don't want to leave anybody out. It's not as if there's a huge group out there. All right. Is that it then? We can close it and I can thank you for the presentation and then uh, you're going to be getting us a copy of this uh, PowerPoint yes. so that we can spread it out. And we look forward, unfortunately we won't be there on, on May 30th, but um, we understand what it is that you're doing and I wish that more of uh, my colleagues had taken this opportunity. They all knew about it. We announced it at the meeting on Friday, but of course this is a Monday morning and uh, you know, I guess they're gearing up for the Ways and Means budget hearings. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We're adjourned.